Ten years ago, on September 21, 2014, Yemen's Houthi rebels took over the capital city of Sana'a from government rule. Months later, a Saudi-led coalition intervened in Yemen to support the internationally recognized government and fight against the Houthis to restore the territories that the group took over. In the years that followed, the country was essentially split in two. The north, controlled by the Houthis where the majority of the population lives, and the south, run by forces loyal to the government. But the battle in Yemen took place not only on the ground, but also behind closed doors. Presidents were ousted, cities were captured and then recaptured, truces were violated, and governing frameworks all rejected. And about a quarter million people are believed to have been killed either directly or indirectly as a result of the war. But the reality is much more bleak, because the real figures and the true scope of the war's destruction are impossible to know. Today in Yemen, a new generation of children are born into a perpetual state of conflict, having known nothing else of their homeland. The war never seemed to end, until a moment in 2022 when the warring parties unofficially agreed to a de facto ceasefire, which although it didn't last, brought the country to a state of no war, no peace, but still caused the violence to dramatically go down. That doesn't mean that the suffering is over. For millions in Yemen, where a polycrisis means struggles for food, water, shelter, medicine, and a fight against diseases and hunger plague at least 18 million people who need some sort of assistance to get by. Millions of people are also internally displaced. The economy is in tatters, pushing the majority of the population into poverty and a compounded climate crisis which has devastated agriculture, making Yemenis even more food insecure. And those who were able to return to their homes have found out that their farms and their houses have been turned into silent war zones, with mines ready to explode and maim or kill at the slightest touch. After a decade of anguish and suffering, what is left of Yemen in the wake of the war? And what future will Yemenis inherit? This is Beyond the Headlines, and I'm your host, Nada Al-Tahir. This week, we look at the roots of today's divided Yemen. We also reflect on the key events that shaped the civil war over the past decade and ask, what will it take to build a functional, dignified future for millions of Yemenis struggling for survival? The rift between Yemen's warring parties actually predates this conflict. I discussed this with Abdel Ghani Iriani, senior researcher at the Sana'a Center for Strategic Studies. Abdul Ghani, before we talk about the civil war, let's go back in time. Tensions between the Houthis and the government actually date back to the early 2000s, with multiple rebellions staged by the Houthis against the long-serving president Ali Abdullah Saleh back then. Tell us about the origins of this rift and how it led to the war today, and what was the final trigger for the Houthis to decide to take over the capital Sana'a? The Houthi movement is a reactionary movement uh, that uh, ascribes to an extreme subsect of Zaydism that that believes that only an imam or one of the descendants of the prophet has the right to rule and that the world was created, heaven and earth and people uh, were created to empower, to enable that imam. And therefore, the the origin of the conflict is really uh, in 1970 when when the royalists lost the civil war that uh, followed the 1962 republican revolution against the imam and uh, in 1970 there was a peace agreement between the royalists and the republicans which which forced the royalists to recognize the republic And many of them, many of the leaders of the royalists, joined a national unity government. But a faction that uh, the most extremist stayed out of the agreement. And that faction is now what we call the Houthis. Yemen has basically been split into two now, with different warring parties controlling different governorates. What is the impact of this on Yemeni civilians who have been the greatest victims of this war, uh, now in its 10th year. But how has the split actually impacted their lives and their livelihoods and their access uh, to basic things like electricity and healthcare and food? I have to uh, give a, just a, the layout of the, of the land. In uh, 2014, 
the Houthis, who had been fighting the government in the north, managed to take over by allying themselves with the old regime of uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh and took over Sana'a, the capital, and took over the institution of, of the Yemeni state and eventually forced everyone else, well, the majority of the uh, political factions, to flee from Sana'a. And many of them uh, ended up in different capitals around the, the region and some of them went to Aden. The Houthis now control all the institutions of the state. And they represent, of course, a small, tiny minority of the people of Yemen. But they came to control the armed forces of the, the Republic of Yemen, the security apparatus. And therefore, they controlled everything. So those people who are under the control of the Houthis still live under working institutions somewhat, but those who are not under Houthi control, while they are not oppressed as the Houthis have oppressed the, their subjects, they don't have access to the institutions, to the organizations that provide basic services. So there is serious crisis in terms of security, in terms of providing health care, providing electricity, etc., and in the Houthis, in the Houthi side, because the Houthis are so corrupt and so inconsiderate of the needs of the people, services are available, but only for those who can pay. The free health care that we used to have, free education, uh, have gone. Electricity in the Houthi areas uh, costs 20 times the price of electricity that used to be and the price of electricity in non-Houthi uh, controlled areas. Basically, services are available for those who can pay and the rest of society is denied almost everything. Abdel Ghani, most of Yemenis rely on food aid for survival, a vast majority, and a lot of it comes through the port of Hadeida. That port itself is a tricky but strategic facility for the millions of people who rely on it for their own survival. What can you tell us about the port of Hadeida? And how has the war actually shaped and impacted the way that aid is brought in through it? There are three major ports in Yemen. There are two Hadeida ports. One is for container traffic and oil and fuel. Another for food stuff like uh, cereals and grains and so on. The Houthis control both. And the third port is in uh, Aden. And it's much smaller. It can provide maybe the 20% of the needs of the population. Therefore, the Hadeida port and the Salif port, which is uh, just 60 kilometers north of Hadeida, provide the bulk of the needs of the people, humanitarian and, uh, and commercial. Uh, the port of Hadeida has been bombed by the Israelis and two-thirds of its capacity has been disabled. And that uh, causes, of course, uh, problems in providing humanitarian assistance to the majority of the population. But still, it is now covered with difficulty. Another strike on the port of Hadeida and port of Salif, and people will starve. The port of Aden is uh, uh, functional, but it can cover only 20% of the needs of the population. Over the course of the last decade, we've seen ceasefires fail again and again. We've also seen urgent warnings by humanitarian organizations about the catastrophic economic conditions, the famine, displacement, disease, and impact on children. But the war kept going on, and the violence continued, even if it has reduced. How has one of the world's worst humanitarian crises gone on this long? War usually creates uh, profit opportunities for those who are engaged in it. And I think the profit and the war economy have been the reason that this war continued for the past 10 years. And and, and uh, th- that is why it hasn't stopped, because those who are working, who are uh, engaged in it, are benefiting from it. Unfortunately, there hasn't been any effort uh, from the international community or from the UN to deal with this very critical issue of 
profiteering and the war economy. And therefore, no matter what people say uh, that they have interest in ending this war, they will not end it until the profit stream stops. There has been a period of relative calm since an unofficial truce was brokered a couple of years ago. But the war is still not over, and now, with the Houthis attacking vessels in the Red Sea over the war in Gaza, chances of a true ceasefire seem even further away. How have the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea actually impacted the prospects for peace? Actually, they have, contrary to uh, conventional wisdom, I think that they have increased the chances of, of peace. And I'll tell you why. Uh, prior to October 7, the Houthis and the Saudis have been negotiating to end the conflict between them and not really ending the conflict in Yemen. Uh, in fact, during the ceasefire, hostilities between the Saudis and the Houthis have stopped, but hostilities between Yemenis had not. If the Saudis step out of the conflict, then the anti-Houthi camp will become so weak so that if, as per uh, the plan of the Saudis, that Yemenis after Saudi Arabia exits the conflict, will then go to negotiations, the Houthis will not give anything to the other side because of the extreme imbalance of power between the two sides. And therefore, some parties in the the anti-Houthi camp may surrender to the Houthis, but others, especially in the South, will never surrender because they cannot accept Houthi leadership, uh, given how vicious the Houthis are, given the long-standing grievances of the South against control but from Sana'a, and given the fact that the, South, uh, the Houthis are so horrible in governance, their state would eventually collapse. It has no, ba- no foundation economically, and therefore, Yemen would be in some something like Somali, the Somali situation where there are warlords here and there controlling bits and pieces of the country. Most of the country is in chaos. The attack on, of the Houthis and the Red Sea made it possible for people who call for a durable peace to point out to the Saudis and to the West that uh, the Houthis are not just a Yemeni problem. They are a problem for the world. And therefore, you cannot allow them to control uh, parts of Yemen to the exclusion of others. And you cannot allow them to be to re- continue unchecked. The only way that you can check them and prevent them from carrying out rogue attacks, although I have to uh, admit that I admire the Houthi stand uh, with the people of Gaza, but uh, attacking civilian ships is just not uh, an acceptable uh, international practice. And there's only one way to stop the Houthis from carrying out such practices, and that is to uh, get them to a power-sharing agreement with other Yemeni parties that are moderate and that are responsible and that would care uh, about Yemen standing internationally and therefore would be able to uh, stop the Houthis from carrying out, out such attacks. Abdul Ghani, can you give us your closing thoughts on what Yemen will look like in 10 years, in your opinion? Well, it's all up in the air. There is a path. If we follow a narrow and straight path towards restoration of stability, Yemen will have restored its institutions and will have taken the first steps towards building its economy. And that narrow path requires two key prerequisites. The first is to restore, to to address the imbalance of power between the government and the Houthis. The Houthis are now much more powerful than the government and therefore they will not enter into power sharing agreement with, with the government. The second is to have a unified strategic stand by the coalition and by the international community in support of unifying the leadership of the of the government so that the government can negotiate effectively with the Houthis and bring a, a peace agreement to reality. That's it for Beyond the Headlines for this week. Follow our coverage on Yemen at thenationalnews.com. 
This episode was produced by Ban Balqawi. Yasmin Al-Taji is our assistant producer and Da'a Farid is our editor. And I'm your host, Nada Al-Tahir.